Writers Corner live show. On this show, we connect authors from around the globe to each other and to their readers. You will meet seasoned as well as new and aspiring authors on the show. Our featured author for this week is none other than the award-winning author Sergio Troncoso. His most recent book is entitled A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant's Son. So don't go away. We will be right back. If you're just joining, hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Brigetti Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa. I'm a live video camera confidence coach, coach and I host and produce live video shows to help brands, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and of course, authors share their stories. I'm also a responsible social media advocate. And in this show, we bring you the backstories of authors and aspiring authors. And my co-host, is Mary Elizabeth Jackson. She is an award-winning author of the Poolicious children's book series. She's also working on another book, which is going to be released at the end of January. Yes, and she's, I know, yay. Mm -hmm. And um, she's also working on a movie screenplay. And so Mary is a wife and a mom to three beautiful humans who inspire her. She's also a special needs and disabilities advocate and lives in Nashville in the USA. And I am down under in Cape Town in South Africa. So let us know where you're watching from. Hey, Mary. Hello. Our first show of 2020. I'm so excited. We should have had guns, not guns going off, but, you know, <laughs> horns and a band and, you know, confetti and everything. So, yeah, I'm super excited that we're back and we have a great year for coming and with you know here now we're going to start off with a great author i'm so excited to start our year off and 2020 is going to be awesome i know i know so let's say hello to um everyone on linkedin marco is joining us on linkedin marco hello nice to see you hi marco and, uh, yeah and hello to our audience on facebook on twitch on periscope on youtube welcome to the first broadcast of the writer's corner live show in 2020 and nice to have you joining us live thank you very very much for joining us and we've got an amazing author um sergio troncoso is the author of a peculiar kind of immigrant son a collection of linked short stories on immigration which Juno Diaz called a masterwork. I'm dying to hear a bit more about this book. Absolutely. He also wrote from this wicked patch of dust which Kirkus Reviews named one of the best books of 2012 in a starred review. The novel also won the Southwest Book Award. Other books by Troncoso include Crossing Borders personal essays and it won the bronze award for essays from forward reviews he's also the author of the nature of truth hailed by the chicago tribune as impressively lucid mm. publishers weekly called his first book the last twitter and other stories richly satisfying he is currently the vice president of the texas institute of letters he served as a judge for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and New Letters Prize for Essays. His work has recently appeared in New Letters, the Yale Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, and the Texas Monthly. And his website where you can find him is called sergiotroncoso.com. Couldn't get mm. easier than that. Right, absolutely. And that's a great thing to have your website, your name, so people can come find you so much easier because a lot of authors um, have multiple books out. And so you can't, you know, it's it's really hard to have a website and stuff for every single book. So just having everything under one thing, one house, one roof is the smartest thing to do. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Well, shall we invite our guest to the show? Yes, let's bring him on. Dying to meet him, so let's invite let's invite him on.
Hello. Hi. So you're welcome to the show. Thank so you for inviting me. You. We're so happy to have you here with us this morning. And well, it's morning for us, right? Morning, kind of midday, and it's evening for Brigetti. So it's kind of cool. We're all connected in different parts of the world. Yeah, I'm in New York, and I know you are near Nashville and Cape yes. Town. That's exciting. I know, very exciting. So we're kind of an international show right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is. That's what I love about live streaming, just being able to connect from different parts of the world. And it's, you know, it feels like we're sitting in the same room just having a chat. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you get to become a writer? What is what is your backstory? How did you get started? Because so many of us have got stories and we, we think, you know, well, we're going to write, but not everyone gets to that point. How did you get started? Well, I got started uh, rather late in life, but but it I would say it all began with my grandmother, uh, on my maternal grandmother. I loved hearing her stories as a kid um, in high school, and she was uh, grew up in a little ranch in Chihuahua, Mexico, mm -hmm. and um, and her she had a really colorful life. She uh, her. Her father and uncle fought with Francisco Villa, Pancho Villa, during the revolution. And so I would bike from Isleta, the suburb, rural suburb where I grew up, to her downtown El Paso to hear these stories of her surviving the revolution as a teenager. Uh, she had uh, shot and killed two men who attempted to rape her. She, wow. oh yeah, she was this, uh, in Spanish you would say caraja, which is this tough lady, this yeah. woman who would not take anything from anybody. And my parents were a little afraid of her. <laughs> uh, but of course, as a kid, she, you know, we were like this, just so together. I loved hearing her stories. And she would be smoking her cigarette in her tenement and drinking her coffee. And it would go to one in the morning under the desert stars. And people would come from other places to listen to these stories about the revolution and about, uh, you know, sometimes very violent stuff. But as a kid, of course, that's what I loved. Uh, I, I often would tell my sons now that it was sort of like Call of Duty, but Mexican style. <laughs> um, and uh, so these, these sort, this sort of oral storytelling was the first thing that really captured me. And in fact, the very first story I wrote as a Yale graduate student um, was about her. It was called the Abuelita. And it was about this uh, Mexi this Yale grad student calling his Mexican grandmother uh, in El Paso and talking to her about German philosophy. Um, and of course, it's sort of this, this clash of generations of the, the, the grandson moving beyond the border and the grandmother really bringing him back to the values that, that, I, that made him who he was. And so, mm. so people say, what are you doing? Is this Latino literature? Is this philosophy and literature? Is this, you know, what, what is this? Is this a, sort of a mixture of Camus with Juno Diaz with Garcia Marquez? And so it was creating, I think, in my mind, something new, mm. a new kind of literature. And, but, but I think the oral storytelling from my grandmother was uh, seminal. It was really what got me started. And, and, and for me, the, the motivation was I wanted to get people like her on the page, in the library, in, in books, because she deserved to be heard. Her voice deserved to be heard. And she had so many things to teach me and other people about how to survive a difficult life, how to have self-worth, you know, even though you faced... Um, tragedy and, and difficulty. And, and by the way, she was the boss of her household. Let me tell you, if my grandfather <laughs> did not give her the money that he worked for, for every week, she would take a broomstick and hit him on the head with it. I am so, telling you. This, so was, she needs to be so in a movie. Laughing. This was she, feminism she needs to be 101. in a movie. She needs to, she be, needs in to be in a movie. Yeah. I yeah. Think like as you're talking, I can actually visually see this whole scenario. And I'm like, why is this woman not in a movie? You got to do it. You got to do it. Well, yeah. I mean, but it was like feminism 101. 
So That's, I grew up. I love it. She needs it, to be it, teaching in schools. Yeah. Well, she was. <laughs> she was. She was just a character, and my parents were afraid of her and said, "Why are you spending so much time with her?" You know. And, and I said, "Well, because she has great stories." And of course, she didn't treat me that way. She. I was her grandson, right. and I was perhaps closest to her. And and people say, "Well, you have a little bit of her character, of her character. You're kind of." tough and you know at, at my my twitter on my twitter uh handle it says si me picas te pico which means if you push me expect the push back mm -hmm. and and i learned that from my grandmother you know that you get respect not by being a wallflower but by fighting for what you want mm -hmm. and and uh you know just i'll tell you this little last piece but when i you know i, I grew up very poor along the border but when i went to harvard i wanted to quit and uh, I called her that first week and I was crying. I said, you know, I don't belong here. Everybody thinks I have an accent. Uh, I should be back in El Paso. And she said, and, and I would call her on Sundays. Back then it was MCI, you know, because it was cheaper to call on Sunday. And she said, uh, Sergio, don't come back with your tail between your legs. Show them who you are. And that kind of grit, that toughness, was what she imparted to me. She didn't know what Harvard was. She didn't know what the Ivy League was, but she understood how to fight. She understood how to struggle for what you want. And so that, that lesson is something she kept teaching me, you know, in person, through her stories, uh, through everything I learned from her. So if you want to know why I became a writer, it really starts with her. Mm, that's nice. A very great way to honor your grandmother and Absolutely. to to honor uh, to honor the woman that she was, um, because not every one of us gets to experience that strength in our life and the way our world is today. Um, I, I, we need more of that in our world. We need more of that teaching our kids and and especially our our, our girls that we're raising how to stand up for and just not take anything. So, you know, it, it's, um, uh, it's a very, it's very much needed, uh, a teaching. Yeah. And, and, of, and of course, you know, growing up in sort of in Mexican El Paso and my parents were Mexican, she was very unusual. You know, she was, she fought against the Mexican machismo that, that in fact, that I, you know, I was, I was talking to Brigitte before, um, that against my father, the biggest conflicts I had with, with my father, in part because of this machismo that he still had. And, and I was learning from my grandmother, you know, this is wrong. This is not how you uh, treat women. And, you know, women not only deserve respect, but for me, they were my models. They were the people I looked up to. They were the people who were the best storytellers. You know, my mother was the reader in the family. And she was the one that I connected with the most. But she was, in fact, um, very much um, wary of her, of her, of her own mother, uh, because of of her experience and how tough she was. Mm. You know, I feel like I want to jump out of my skin right now. I have got to introduce you to a a great grandmother in the UK. Um, her name is Valerie Woodgager, and she would absolutely love you. And I think you love her too. Um, she started this movement called Learn with Grandma, and it's exactly what you were talking about was um, joining the generations um, and bridging that, you know, through a, through bridging the, the, the gap through digital um, media. And, um, and the idea is to, um, for the younger generation to teach digital skills to the old generation and the old generation will pass down their values. So it would be a two-way um, two learning. And yeah. I want to say hello to Sarah from um, Ireland, Sarah McCoy from Ireland. Yeah, hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. So, um, so yeah, when you were talking about your grandmother, I kept thinking Valerie's going to love the story. I really need to share this broadcast with her because she will love this. Yes, yeah, she'll, and, be, she'll be wanting to hook up with you, Sergio. Yeah, well, I, I would, you know, I would love to talk because for me, the, you know, my ancestors and my grandmother in particular had the best stories and, and they were real. That was even more important. It wasn't something she was making up. This was her life. This is how she survived. This is how she she crossed over into 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 the United States from Mexico, 
And so, so it was, um, you know, it, I just felt so lucky to know her. And, and, and the, her character, I would bring, later when I was at Harvard, I would bring people to meet her. And, and, and she, would, she would size them up right there on the spot. She would say, this guy is just a little liar telling you a bunch of BS. You know, she did not care anything about social niceties. If she, you had to be straight with her. You had to be honest with her. And if you tried to pretend or put on airs, she would cut you to the quick right then and there. And she didn't give a crap. You know, and that's how she was. And so she taught me that sort of righteousness to, to believe in yourself and, and, and know who you are and, and follow sort of an ethical code. And so, um, so for me, every weekend I, I would bike from Isleta on the outskirts about 15 miles as a eighth grader, ninth grader. And I would spend weekends with my grandmother hearing her stories and then go to the library and, and, and read more stories in downtown El Paso. So that, that was really the genesis of my writing. That's awesome. And think about that today. Um, you know, you wouldn't let your, your eight or nine year old kid bike anywhere for even a couple of miles just because yeah. our world is so different. So that period of time back then, um, we could do things like that. And it, yeah. and it was much safer for children yeah. to do that. And a lot of times kids were gone all day and didn't see their parents till dinner time. And parents didn't know where anybody was because nobody had cell phones yeah. or people or pagers or anything. So, yeah. um, and so, I mean, it, it's really very rich what you had growing up and uh, something that was free and, you know, was, it, it's really priceless. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but my, my mother, when I started on my bike, would uh, do the sign of the cross and oh. give me like five dimes to call along the way oh. and uh, until I got to my grandmother's house. And wow. uh, so it, was, it was sort of an adventure, uh, but I loved doing it on, on Saturdays and spending the weekend with her. So this seems to be a movie. I, I could just already see it. I can, I can just visually see this as a movie. You just need to... Do it. You, you know, we have one life to, life to live. And if we don't do it now, it'll never get done, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, I write a lot about her. And yeah. uh, and people, you're not the first one, by the way, to say that. I'm uh, sure. <laughs> that, that, that my, my grandmother should really be, and p people who met her know that this was this was how she was. And, uh, and a lot of it was how she grew up, that social chaos of the Mexican Revolution, um, and uh, the difficulty and, and surviving all of that, surviving bad men, surviving violence, surviving and coming over and, and, and living in Texas finally. So, uh, and, and even this latest book uh, has sort of a version of my grandmother in the last story, um, which is called um, Eternal Return. Um, and so it's a, you know, in that story, which is the last story that appeared in the Yale Review, um, this 50 year old is coming back and he's visiting his dead grandmother. So it has this sort of aspect of, of magical realism. But the, the point of the story is, and, and something that certainly happens to me is I have conversations with her all the time. I know mm -hmm. her so well. I think about what would my grandmother do? You know, and her name was Doña Lola, uh, her Dolores, but uh, her diminutive was Lola, Doña Lola, Mrs. Lola. Miss Lola, and ah, uh, Sarah was just asking what her name, what your grandmother's name was. So Dolores <laughs> Rivero, yeah, L Lola Rivero, and um, and so you know she she continues to be a very important figure in my literary life because I think it's it's about honoring just exactly what Mary Elizabeth said, who she was, what she stood for, what she fought for, and and to give her a voice, you know, to give her a voice in in literature. So I still, get, I still get a little choked up, by the way. I bet you do. I was just sitting yeah. here thinking about that. I was just thinking about her. She's with you. She's around you. You can probably hear her. Um, I know every once in a while, I, when the wind blows and there's a certain sound or smell, it reminds me of my grandmother from my childhood. So, um, you know, and, and I think those old stories in our past and the history of our families is just it, it, it really grounds us in who we are and it grounds our children in who we are. I mean, I know my, my grandmother was, um, went through the, the, uh, the depression, you know, so she, um, 
they were, you know, they went through a time they were very poor and the people who owned the store in the town, she had her at a baby, the owner's wife, she had no breast milk. So my grandmother was the nursemaid for her own children and the woman who owned the store. And that's how they got their food. And I, I think that's fascinating. Yeah. No, and, and, it, and, and it just shows also the different times of people trying to connect and doing whatever it takes to survive and to thrive. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, things like what your grandmother went through, uh, there's no fluff. Um, there's no frosting on the cake. There's no, oh, bless you, uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's just that it, it's it's real. And she had to grow up very young and she had to be an adult at a very young age and make those decisions. So life is a little bit more serious for someone like her. Right. In, and, in the time period. And, and, and let me tell you, the the one of my the, the best memories I have is she would turn up the stereo, put on her Mexican polkas, and start twirling my grandfather around the living room. Like, there was a <laughs> lot of joy despite all of the suffering she she encountered. I mean, she she was you know she was glad to be there. She was glad to have survived, and so there was a lot of music and dancing. Um, but you know, you got on her bad side, and it would turn. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you don't want to meet her in a back alley somewhere. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness! So let's get to your to you. Let's switch to your to your book. Um, what was the inspiration for a peculiar peculiar kind of immigrant son? Have you got a copy of the book with you? Yes, I do. Right here. Here it is. Peculiar kind of immigrant son. So um, a lot of what what I did. I'm going to put it down now. I guess. Um, okay. Is they're, they're, these are thirteen linked stories, and they're all about immigration, um, different immigrants coming. And it's a, it's a hot topic in America. <laughs> yeah, it is, and and in fact, it, the book is doing phenomenally well. I th it's selling actually better than any of my previous six books, uh, five books, and um, so I'm I'm happy about that. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're always, uh, you know, literary work. You never know what's going to happen. But right. these, these 13 stories are all about immigrants coming to the United States or and going beyond the border. Because I've written a lot about Americans who have just crossed over and living on the border um, to, the, to Mexico. But these are immigrants going deeper into America, going into the Midwest going into New York City, to Connecticut, and, and how sometimes they succeed, and sometimes how they fail, and uh, other times their identities, how they're trying to live in between two worlds, between languages, let's say Spanish and English, between what your ancestors taught you versus the new values you're learning as an American, as you're assimilating. And so it's it's this this um, push and pull of the self, so to speak, that I'm always very interested in. So, so these thirteen stories, what happens? Uh, one of my graduate degrees at Yale is in philosophy, so I, I'm heavily into people like Nietzsche and Heidegger and Wittgenstein. Um, and so, and this is all about uh, the fragmentation of the self, how we are uh, at once. Um, our past self, as well as the present self, as well as the self from El Paso in a rural area, as well as the self who is living in New York City, for example, or the self who grew up speaking Spanish at home, but now I use primarily English, and then I learned German as well to, to, um, you know, to read these philosophers. So my inspiration for writing these 13 stories is to link them together. So as you read a character, in, for example, in the first story, that character will reappear in the next story from a different angle. And so what I'm trying to get the reader to experience is this perspectivism of, of the self and of even to encounter your own reader biases, where you might see as a reader a character in a favorable light in, in a first story. And then the next story, you will see that same character from a different point of view or from a different character's point of view, let's say his spouse or her spouse, and you will ha you'll have a very different, um, uh, you know, a very different um, way of looking at that same character. And so, so it's uh, it's about immigration, and it's about 
uh, immigrants in the United States trying to become American, struggling, sometimes being accepted, sometimes being attacked. Uh, but it's also about um, this play and, on characterization and time. Um, so the characters appearing and reappearing, you know, within these stories. Um, and so the, the very first story, for example, Rosary and the Border, I'll just sort of mention that, is, um, is this 50-year-old from, from Texas who's coming back to the border after having left and having become educated in the United States uh, at the best schools, and so it's somewhat autobiographical, uh, coming back to bury his father. And so all of this uh, event prompts a lot of questions about who he is, uh, how he started, uh, how he became an American, what kind of an American he is, this hybrid of between cultures and languages. And, um, and it sets off the story in a very realistic way. So by the end of the 13 stories in this a peculiar kind of immigrant son, you get the last story, which is much more magical realist in a way in which uh, a similar character is returning and talking to his dead grandmother and and she's ha he's having a real conversation with her and, and all sorts of strange things are happening. He's going back and forth through time. So again, this is playing with um, the self and characterization and even, even reader bias in, in how you take a particular um, character um, either in a favorable way or an unfavorable way. So, so I'm always mixing these um, worlds in a way, the world of philosophy and the world of, of let's say, Mexican-American literature and the world of literary fiction. Um, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I like to do. That's wonderful. And it gives it a lot of richness and, and depth and all that stuff. I'm going to tell my, my, my sister-in-law got her doctorate at Harvard, so I'm going to definitely wow. tell her found a book that she needs to read and a new author because she loves to read, so. Yeah, and, and for I me, like, going to Harvard was like going to Mars, because I mean, <laughs> I, grew, I, I grew up, you know, as I, as I was chatting before we started, you know, I tell my Yale kids I grew up with an outhouse in the backyard and uh, no electricity. And right. we, had, we had kerosene lamps and stoves. Um, and I think what the poverty does is it, it really centers you and it either you know either you you survive it or you don't, mm -hmm. and and so for me going to Harvard and then to Yale, for me was a huge leap forward, um, and and in a way also a, challenged me to keep who I was, who I had been on the border, my grandmother's son. How am I going to keep that part of me, still a, a vibrant part of me? Even though I am now, you know, living in New York City or in, in, in teaching in the Ivy League, so so that sort of challenge of living between different worlds has always been with me. And it makes you who you are, which yeah. is very unique. Yes, absolutely. I want to just give a shout out to Joseph Carabas who's watching us on um, on LinkedIn as well. And Joseph says, "Thank you very much for holding up your book." Do you want to hold up a second? We've yes. we are Hold up for for a second again. Here it is. Um, so, so that is the book. And where can people find a copy of your book, Sergio? Well, it's available, of course, uh, on Amazon. Um, it's uh, and it's also available on Kindle as well. And it was uh, it's also it's available if you're in the United States. It's available through any independent bookstore, uh, whether it's Kramer Books in Washington D.C. or Book People in Austin. Um, but uh, the easiest way to get it is uh, is probably, you know, through Amazon or through the indie bookstore website uh, that you know you just type in your zip code and 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 it'll tell you what the nearest independent bookstore yeah is ar uh, around you. So wonderful, awesome. Well, I hope that you gain a lot of new fans and readers from today, and we will be you know that we are live. We're on five different. Uh, social medias, right? And it'll go out through podcasting and word of mouth always helps too. Yeah. No, I mean, and I, I love to get out there. I am actually traveling a lot. I had been traveling a lot when the book came out in October and uh, doing a stint in Texas. I was doing, I think, eight, nine days. I, I drove 661 miles to yeah. events in Austin, events in San Antonio, back in Austin, San Marcos, uh, even uh, close to Houston, right outside of Houston. 
so uh, in Texas, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I guess I'm pretty well known. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big state. Well, <laughs> yeah. Now you're not in Cape Town, South Africa as well. <laughs> and Nashville. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would love to go. I'd love to travel. No, well, awesome. you're welcome anytime. You know, now you know how to get hold of me. So, you know, if ever your travels bring you this way, do let us know. I would love to meet up with you. Yeah, and, and by the way, my editor that's mentioned in the back of the book, um, The Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son, is... Um, spends most of her time Jessica Powers in South Africa and has written a lot about South Africa. Yes. So um, so she keeps inviting me to go. Well, there you go. Now you have somebody you can visit. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, and Joseph Caraba said the book is already on his order list. So oh, you've got awesome. a fan on LinkedIn. And Joseph's a great author. You have to look him up. Yes. He's a really good man. I will. Yeah. Yes, he is. Right. So, Jess, thank you so much. We're out of time. I want to say a huge big thank you to our audience who's joined us live. Sarah says Africa, uh, um, and she says have a great day. Sarah, thanks for joining thank us. You, it was lovely having you participate in the show, and thank you very much to Joseph on LinkedIn and also to Marco. It was great having you join us. Um, Sergio, don't go away. We'll put you in the green room, and we'll have it. We'll, we'll We'll get back to you in a minute. So thank you very much for being a wonderful guest. We loved hearing your story today. Can I just give a shout out to both of you and thank you for inviting me to your show. I think you were you're wonderful to be with. And I love having this sort of coffee clutch through the airwaves. Thank you so much. We love it. We, we've had a great time and it is. Uh, we thank you so much for blessing us today by being here. We'll, we'll see you in the green room in a minute. That was an awesome first show for 2020. I don't think it could have been better. Joseph, uh, Sergio's story was amazing. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. And I do hope that you'll consider turning his his story into a movie because his grandma <laughs> is an awesome woman. I would love to meet his grandma. <laughs> So, yes, what an exciting uh, morning this has been and evening for you. And we're so grateful that Sergio was able to be here with us today. And, and we're big fans now. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was lovely having you here on our first show for 2020. And we'll see you back again next week, same time, same place. And thank you for joining us. Do good stuff. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.